Regarde-moi. Oh, yeah, yeah, gotcha, okay. All right, welcome everybody. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can uh, hear me okay. And bear with us, this is our first ever YouTube live uh, webinar slash science figure makeover. So if we experience any technical difficulties, um, I apologize, but I think we've sort of worked out all the kinks right now and um, should be ready to go in just a minute. And we'll give everybody just a minute to kind of get settled in. And we'll get started. Um, I also want to say thank you for joining our um, SciComm week. I think it's been a lot of fun. Sounds like you've all enjoyed some of the tips and tricks that we've been tweeting about all week. So if you like it, um, you know, we'll be doing more of that hopefully in the next couple of months. Um, maybe make it a, a monthly thing or bi-monthly. If you have requests or um, feedback, um, or if you have actual figures that you want feedback on and you want to submit that, let us know. Um, I'll throw up some email contacts at the end of this that you can reach out to. Um, but you can always email us um, support at buyerrender.com with any questions and it'll get triaged to the right person on the team. So we'd love to hear from you. Great. Okay. Well, um, I guess we can get started. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the uh, huge importing of um, feedback and requests for having your figures uh, critiqued and edited live. Um, it was very brave of you to submit your images um, for us to kind of disseminate and uh, learn from. Actually, almost all of them were really beautifully illustrated. We were really impressed with the submissions. And um, we picked a handful for this sort of YouTube live critique. But um, as I said, we're gonna be doing this pretty frequently. So we hope that um, we get to actually get to all of them, all the submissions at one point at least, um, and be able to give you feedback on your figures. Now, I know some of the figures that you've submitted are actually time sensitive. So some of you are presenting or you're publishing in a journal and you needed your figures edited for that reason. So um, if we don't get to it, uh, we're going to email everyone that submitted um, and didn't get selected for this round. Um, you know, we can help you before your deadline um, if we can, if we can kind of squeeze it in. Um, otherwise, we will definitely get to it in the coming weeks or months, as I mentioned, because we're going to be running these sort of critiques pretty regularly. Um, so as you can see, you can probably see my screen right now, hopefully. It's just the sort of buyer render interface. And if you'd like to follow along, you're welcome to sign up for an account. It is There is a free version. Um, everything that I'm going to be covering today as far as tips uh, you should be able to do on the free version as well. Um, that being said, there are a lot of really cool bells and whistles and features that you don't get on the free version. If you want to try out the paid version, there's a um, two-week free trial you can you can sign up for. So um, what I'm going to do is do a really quick recap. Um, I'm just going to create a new figure here. A quick recap of sort of the tips and tricks that we covered in our SciComm week this week. Um, it was really exciting to see the engagement. We didn't know how much you all wanted to see tips and tricks, but it sounds like it's something that you really enjoy. Um, I've just summarized here a few of the major themes that we covered. And as we go through some of these figures that you've submitted, um, I'm going to use this as kind of a checklist or cheat sheet of the things that we see very common mistakes um, you know, within the science figure 
you know, creation process. And they can be roughly sort of categorized into the three topics that we covered on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which is layout and spacing, um, color and contrast, and then text, fonts, and arrows. So these are very rough guidelines. They actually kind of bleed into each other, but it's good to have a little bit of a reminder of things that we should uh, cross-check for um, and at least gut check at the end of every figure until it starts to become and feel more natural. In fact, even in-house with our medical illustration team, as we create templates and icons, we go through our own extensive checklist. Um, and in fact, everybody on the team is required to have a grayscale filter when we go through critiques so that we know that every template that we kind of, you know, launch within the app is, um, you know, properly contrast checked uh, so that when you go to make your figure based on that template, we can ensure that uh, your figures are going to turn out really nicely. So I'm going to use this as sort of a guideline as we go through some of the figures that were submitted and that we'll kind of do the makeovers for. Um, and as I mentioned, all of the figures submitted were really beautiful. Um, in fact, the ones that I've selected here, I thought just required a little bit of an edit and it kind of would be, you know, immediately publication ready. So I'm just going to go back to our YouTube live channel here to see if there are any questions. Looks like we're okay. I do have a couple of colleagues uh, monitoring the chat box. So if you have questions throughout this sort of tutorial, feel free to type that in and we can get to your questions um, even though you know, I'm kind of going to be going through the tutorial, they can answer the questions for you. Okay, sorry, I'm toggling around the windows here. Um, okay, so the first figure that I will look at here is So this figure submitted by uh, Philip Slavkovich, I hope I pronounced that right, um, from the Institute of Plant Science in France. Uh, the figure title is called Model of Genetic Control of Nectary Development. Um, so great figure. I thought we'll start pretty simple here. They did a really good job of keeping this uh, very clean and um, you know, the black and white is actually quite nice. What I'm going to do is just quickly screenshot this and add it to our sort of before and after slide deck here so we can take a look at it after the fact. Um, so compositionally really nice, it's centered, um, you know, not too many arrows, not too many labels. Uh, because it's black and white, it's already doing the contrast check for us. So everything looks pretty good, probably would print even really well on an inkjet printer at home. Um, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. The one thing that stood out to me was that the outline here was a little dark. And uh, because the letters inside are quite delicate, and so are the arrows, um, what I would do is immediately go back and knock down the opacity of the background. Now, if you go too far, obviously, we're going to lose that resolution. So probably about halfway through, I notice when I go back to the original, it's quite dark. Um, I would knock it back to maybe about 60, even 50%. Because what you really want to see is the labels. I'm going to zoom out here. And side note, I apologize, my computer fan is going off really loud. Uh, when we did our test, it was registering in the microphone. So I apologize if you can hear it. Um, that's the uh, beauty and curse of using a MacBook Pro laptop for my work, but um, hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, so that's already, you know, taking it from kind of 80% to 90% complete. And um, again, I picked this figure because I thought it was, you know, pretty much almost complete here. It looks like there was kind of a, a crop in from another figure that was imported into this image so you, you you I can tell a little bit that that's what happened the arrows are a little bit skewed 
it was probably a really good hack because you know you were able to or the person was able to throw this in really quickly and complete the figure so I definitely encourage shortcuts where you can find it so that's very clever but I probably go back in and uh, you know finish off this figure using the arrows in, in within BioRender or whatever software you're using by the way all of these um, sort of makeovers I am using BioRender but the principles really are application agnostic you can use PowerPoint Adobe Illustrator whatever you want and um, they'll apply no matter what software you use of course the tools available in each one are going to be a little bit different but um, for the for the most part it'll be pretty translatable um, what I would also do is because <clears throat> You've already got these really nice curves happening with the external shape. Um, what I would actually do is probably use more of a curved arrow to really um, follow that follow that organic kind of shape. We are dealing with an organic structure after all, which is you know this developing um, plant. So you can see already that's creating a little bit of a more harmonious, I'm going to flip that, a bit of a harmonious, um, you know, structure there. Um, same with this inhibitor line, probably go in and actually, you know what, I can just erase that, copy and paste this. Even having a little bit of a slight curve to the arrow gives it a bit of a more organic structure. I actually don't remember where the arrow was pointing, but I think I'll be fine. Change it to an inhibitor line. <clears throat> I also hope that uh, for the beginners of Byron, you're getting a little bit of sense of the ease of use of the tool. This is not necessarily going to be um, a tutorial on how to use Byrender necessarily, but um, I guess by default, uh, you will kind of get a sense of of how easy it is to use. So I'm just using the nodes here to kind of, um, again, create a bit of a wave motion. Um, there we go. So it's already looking a little bit more organic. Um, again, I'd probably fix up the top here and redo that so that um, the font is consistent. Um, for the purposes of this sort of critique, I won't do that here. But you can see that we're already getting a better shape, a better um, curvature to the entire illustration. I make it a little bit more curved. Maybe make it dashed. Like so. So already looking better. Um, and then the ones that are really straight, they actually kind of stick out like a sore thumb a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to finish off this figure before moving to the next one. There we go. Um, and I'd also be careful with these inhibitor lines. I see this quite a, quite often where they're short enough that it could be uh, misinterpreted for like a capital letter T. Um, in that case, again, I'd probably maybe increase the length of that line. Um, I'd also maybe decrease the size of that arrowhead so it's a little bit more subtle. It's all about, you know, the proportions. The decrease, so you can see you can increase the size of that inhibitor line head and I'm just decreasing it there. Well, that's already looking better. Um, if I want to get a little more fancy with the hierarchy of the text, so let's go back to our little cheat sheet here. It's in my uploads panel, so I can actually pull it out into any figure that I have. And I'll kind of stick this in the area of my canvas that doesn't get rendered. And close up the library tab. Um, and so going into the third category, text, fonts, and arrows, 
use text hierarchy. So I don't really know where it'll rest my eye here. Where does this process begin and end? Um, even if it's cyclical, I still want um, point zero or point, you know, at um, the moment in which I should, you know, start my eye and kind of move around the page. Maybe it's the center here. There's a lot of emphasis in the middle, a lot of converging arrows. Maybe that's the focal point, and I'll just maybe increase the size of the font and the boldness. And already I kind of know where to draw my eye as far as, you know, where to focus in. So just a few, um, you know, minor tips there. If I spent a little more time kind of finicking with the, with the arrows a little bit, I'd probably get a little bit more of a natural composition. Just some more alignment. Um, contrast checker, it looks like we're fine there. Um, let's see, doesn't look like we're using any lines to label anything because the words themselves are the objects in this case, so that looks okay. Um, and then be careful of these short little sticks that can be misconstrued for letters, make sure they're long enough um, or curved enough that they will be interpreted as uh, motion or action. Okay, so... I'm going to go ahead and screenshot this as well and throw that in there. So already before and after, we got a little bit more of a natural curve to that, which is looking very nice. Okay, so that's figure one. We're going to go back to my folder here of figures. Let's see if there's any questions. Okay, great. So I have a question here. It says, you recommend that bigger shapes sort of dictate the flow of the arrows and flowchart words? Absolutely, yes. Very, very uh, insightful. <clears throat> we do try to work within the constraints of whatever it is that the overall shape is, and that is not limited to just the actual icons on the page. It could also mean that if you're working on like a five inch by five inch graphical abstract, you work uh, kind of within those parameters as our border for creating the figure itself. So different figure sizes require and demand different compositional layouts. And I've picked a couple of other figure, figures here to kind of prove that. Um, let's see here. Don't think I caught the author name for this figure. Maybe um, I've got my colleague Brigitte on the line. Um, maybe you can a bunch of late author for that, and then we'll get to that one after this next one. Um, let's see. Let's pick this one here. There you go. And go back. Sorry, I'm jumping around here. I'm going to grab the author's name. I think I put it in this file. No. The nice thing about Byrender as well is you can see that there's sort of a breadcrumb trail along the top. Um, there's gallery view, and then my folder, and then my figure name. Okay, we're going to find out the author name for this one as well. Sorry, it, I thought I had pasted it in there. So I select this one because, you know, another challenge is, of course, you want to show a whole bunch of information in a small area. In this case, the small area is um, this sort of plant cell wall. And it is true that everything in a cell is sort of crammed together. There's almost no space at all. Um, you know, for labels and, and proteins and such like this on a more graphical level. Um, but there are things that we can do to um, maybe make this figure a little bit more approachable. If you ever find that you've finished your figure and you feel like things are feeling very cluttered and kind of claustrophobic and you don't know what to do because, you know, everything in your figure is important, you don't want to remove anything. Um, I would say one thing that I would do is... Um, here. Definitely decrease the size of, or sorry, the opacity of the organelles. 
So opacity is one thing that a lot of people are maybe nervous to play with because you really want your things to kind of jump out at you. But um, sometimes it really isn't that necessary to have it to see what you mean, um, especially because it is labeled below as well. Um, of course, be careful not to do it too far because you don't want to lose that contrast. But you'd be surprised how much you can push it. There we go. Vacuole really differentiate these background elements from the main part of the story. So if you're talking about the level of proteins and downstream effects of those um, of those genes or those proteins, you really don't. Your audience is obviously very technical. They look like there's a floating protein down here on first glance. I'd probably pick the label color that's close to that object. So it's already knocked back. Maybe I'll even soften it a little bit by going lighter. Same with the vacuole. This is not that important, I'd say, for the story. Maybe it is, and um, I can be proven wrong later. But it's, it's almost an after afterthought. You really want the attention drawn to the main area. You you can't um, you know you can't have the audience pay attention to every single part of your image. It's kind of like a painting. A really successful painting is one that the artist has really described the main focal point and everything else kind of diffuses to the edges, at least for realistic paintings. Um, the Golgi. So you can see that I'm picking colors for the organelles that are somewhat related to the object color. Um, looking at our cheat sheet again, let me drag that out. And make it a little bigger for you can, so you can see it. Um, one thing I'd look at here is the idea of, of uniform padding and spacing. So uh, within BioRender specifically, there is the ability to, um, you know, I'm going to show my rulers. There we go. And if you wanted to know how I did that, I just there's a little ruler button here on the right. Um, we even have grid lines, actually. Not many people know that. You can turn on, on and off grid lines. Um, but actually even add in some guidelines here. So you can see I'm adding um, these sort of spacers. Now maybe it's important that these organelles really do butt up right up against the edge of the plant cell wall, but it would be nice if there was a little bit of breathing room. So what I'm gonna do is shrink down the vacuole just a little bit, shrink down the mitochondria just a little bit so it's within the borders and you might need to readjust some of the proteins in there. But already this is going to be a much cleaner composition, as you can see. Oh, I forgot to actually uh, screen cap the original. Um, what I can do is actually go back in time and reopen a version of this illustration um, and you know, kind of create a version controlled copy of that. So it'll create a new copy. It won't override my current figure, which is really nice. Um, let's see. Sorry, my internet's a little bit slow right now. Let's see if that brings it up. And that way we can have a nice before and after figure and do a little comparison of it. Just give it a minute to load. See if I have any questions coming in. Oh, thank you. So, looks like the attribution has been described. Great. Why are serif fonts better for labels? Great question. I will answer that. Let me make a note to answer that. 
But the short answer is that serif fonts, oh sorry, sans serif fonts, did I put serif? It's actually supposed to be sans serif. Okay, here's the before recovered version. Let me just get a quick screen cap of that. Throw it into our before and after slide deck here. And I'll go back to my gallery. So you can see there, even if your browser crashes, um, it's really nice to have this version control where you can kind of go back in time. I think Google Docs has this too, um, where you can go back to previous versions. Um, click my... Oops. There we go. So you can see I've got my version that I was working on and then um, the recovered version. So I'm just going to go ahead and open the, the after version of the before and after. And to answer your question while that loads, serif fonts have those little decorations inside the font like Times New Roman or Garamond. Um, uh, I think Courier does as well. Um, and sans serif, it's just easier to differentiate. It's a more legible font, so you can differentiate between the letters as opposed to reading whole bodies of text, which uh, serif fonts are more suited to. Um, in fact, I'll use a really quick example here that shows a serif versus sans serif font. So this is a sans serif. And if you see that we use um, something like a serif font, it's a little more decorative. It looks, um, I guess, more textbooky in some ways, like the old school textbooks. Um, but it's just a little bit cleaner compositionally to have the versions of the fonts that don't have that decoration on them. So a Helvetica, Arial is really nice too. You'll notice most billboards use sans serif, so the simpler um, version of fonts, as well as logos. A lot of logos are moving towards this sans serif font. Um, if you look at Google's logo sort of evolution, it goes from serif to sans serif because it also gives a little bit more of a modern look. Um, with the digital age, a lot of you know online web-based text is sans serif. So here's our figure again. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a contrast checker here to see if we're doing okay contrast-wise. So I'll go to preview and grayscale. Uh, it's looking pretty good. I think this channel here is getting a little bit lost in the chloroplast background. So we should go ahead and try to make um, that a little bit more obvious in color. And then, um, yeah, we've got some arrows here that are kind of nicely laid out. Um, let's go back and make it not grayscale. Oops. Go back to that. Sorry about my slow internet here. Hopefully the video quality is doing okay. Just check in here how many we've got. All right. I'm going to view back in color. Okay. So, all already looking much better. Um, let's see here. So, this was actually a version um, that my colleague had put together. So, it looks a little bit different than the one that I was working on but what she actually did was she did kind of um when you watch those cooking shows and they kind of magically bring out a half or fully baked cake uh within like the 10 minutes of them demoing and that's what i kind of wanted here so that you didn't watch me play with the arrows and all of that but what she did was she made a really nice clean layout with the new arrows um sort of the nice curvature of the arrows here follows the path a little bit nicer as opposed to a bit more of a jagged flow um, as we checked with the contrast tracker, maybe I would have uh, selected a slightly stronger colored channel. Um, so you can always play with that as well. 
maybe a brighter color. Um, but if you're going to change one of them, make sure that you change it, you know, throughout your entire figure. So um, actually what we have is this dandy tool called Select All Same Icon, and you can actually change the color of all of the proteins in one go. So you can see I'm changing all of them at the same time. So a really handy tool when you want to just change the color of the channel really quickly. So that's looking really nice. I think that's pretty well suited to go to print. Um, we're just missing this one little Golgi here. There we go. Um, any action items or verbs that need changing? No, I think it looks looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and screenshot that. Throw it in there. Great. Okay. So moving on to our next submission. And if you're just joining us now, what we're doing is we're going through a few of the submissions that we've received uh, from people like yourselves. Uh, maybe you're joining right now if you did submit one of these. Thank you so much. Um, we had probably uh, close to 100 submissions, so we could only take you know a handful, of course. And so um, we really appreciate all of you brave volunteers submitting your figures. Here's an interesting image that, I, that we've selected um, that I thought was very well laid out. Very interesting um, kind of composition. And this was interesting because you've probably had this experience where you wanted to compare four processes happening in maybe different objects or entities. Um, and you have this kind of quadrant look and feel. And this was submitted by Ariana Basile or Basile from Padre University. And the figure is describing a schematic representation of the TCA cycle of the four dominant species present in the acidogenic reactor. Okay, very cool. So composition looks very nice. Um, one thing I would say that struck me right away was just how this line, I'm going to zoom in. This line kind of juts right across the cell and um, generally speaking, in the design world, we try to avoid using lines that are parallel or exactly parallel to, uh, to objects. So this is what I mean. This line right here is kind of running across the bottom of that cell. Now, if that's important, maybe it does go through along the cell membrane. Um, perhaps that's what is happening here. But um, if it's not, then I would recommend trying to make sure that um, we separate that, those lines, because it, when it gets abstracted like that, it's a little bit hard to tell. And it looks like you were creative with the lines you used here, so that's great. We don't have bracket errors yet in BioRender, I don't think, but we're going to be launching that soon. So I'll make the lines also a bit thicker so it's visible. Uh, maybe 0.3 is enough. Or three points, maybe two. Yeah, two looks good. So you just be careful when, when lines overlap or they're really close together that they're just barely touching. Very, very minor points here because, again, this, this figure is quite successful. Um, I was also noticing that the individual elements, and this is a very, very common challenge, um, the citric acid, the isocitric acid, um, all of these words within the blue box are getting a little hard to read at the scale um, at which it'll be finally printed or maybe published online. That might be okay if this is kind of almost symbolic of a Krebs cycle. You don't, you're not really trying to teach what the Krebs cycle is, I'm assuming, for every single cell type. Um, but it is a little... Um, disorienting when you can't read the words you almost feel like you're failing an eye test and so um, perhaps I would make that a little bit more clear by making it larger um, I think maybe the text is bolded so you can unbold that to make it look a little less uh, blurry 
So if I go in here, um, and I kind of go in and select the text and unbold it, and perhaps make it a larger size, I just go around the entire circle there and, um, you know, fix up the size of the square. And then you get a little bit more legibility that way, even if it's not important to be, you know, again, teaching what the crime cycle is to your audience. See, already that's a little bit more clear. Um, bolding text can actually hurt you sometimes if the word is too small. So there, I've only increased it by like a point or two and very, very legible. Um, one other thing that I would recommend, and this is also a very, very common, um, I guess, mistake that I see, and great selection of colors, by the way. I think it's very muted. It's very nice. It's soothing to look at. Not too saturated, not too jarring. I'm going to center the image here for you just so you can see it. Um, some things that happen is when you're trying to label something, um, the placement of the label is actually quite important. So you noticed here that we have, um, you know, the top two labels for the top two cells are actually on top of the cell, and the bottom two labels are underneath. Uh, when I immediately opened this image, I actually thought that maybe the title of the figure was the top two labels and the bottom two were maybe captions or a caption for the figure. So um, in order to make it very obvious that it's a label, I'd probably move it underneath. And since you've got one of the labels in two lines, maybe I'd just make that consistent by doing this. I'm going to center both of these, move this down, and don't feel bad that you're, you're having to, you know, kind of move things around quite a bit. You'd be surprised that in the design world we do do this a lot. There's just so much, you know, small modifications and nudging things here and there. Um, that's kind of part of the design process is no one ever gets it right the first time. So you have to be a little bit clever with how you place these labels, of course. Um, I probably even adjust the canvas size to give us a little bit more um, breathing room. It might feel like a waste of space when you add in that padding uh, because that's just that much space that you're not occupying with content but it really does help in clarifying. So see, just moving the label underneath the object already makes it look like they're all consistently labels for those objects. And um, I'm just going to move these elements down a little bit. And you'll be surprised, so much of the design process is just nudging things around because nudging it, like all of these little micro tweaks are going to actually make your figure that much better. Um, and to be super consistent here, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that that alphanumeric is actually on its second line. And then center all the labels. So already looking much cleaner. Um, I'm going to give them a little bit more breathing room actually in between each other as well. So move this guy over. I'm not sure if this is actually supposed to be touching this, but if it is, then maybe you can you know, make it a little bit larger. Um, and I mentioned earlier, but I'd probably avoid these sharp cornered arrows and try to use a little bit more of the you know natural naturally curved arrows. Now I'm going to kind of you can see how it's got like a natural curve to it. 
Oops. If you're a keyboard shortcut kind of person, we also have really nice keyboard shortcuts um, with, built within the app. It actually just opens up right here on the right. It'll change depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC. It'll be Control or Command. Um, and I think this was pointing at the chemical, so it doesn't necessarily need to point to the label. I'm going to move it down here. Um, and then one cool little trick that we have is this sort of faded line. So if I add that, it kind of gives it a nice faded tail, uh, which looks really nice to the eye when you're trying to communicate motion or movement. Um, it looks like a pretty important concept, so I'm actually going to make that line thicker. There we go. So already, you know, you have a nice flow there. I'm going to remove this guideline. There we go. So already more breathing room. Um, I'd probably even move these cells away from each other a little bit. I know we're trying to show that they're interacting to some degree, but I think you can nudge those away from each other. Um, and then I'd probably go in and perhaps even change this kind of square arrow to something a little bit more natural feeling. Actually, I'm going to just use this arrow to do so. And I think it was going over here. I'm just going to pretend like I, I think it was here to here about. And the nice thing is actually you can kind of create these sort of um, wavy lines, which is really nice, like so. So yeah, feel free to try to, you know, kind of create these really natural curves to your arrow with environment. There's a lot of flexibility with the types of arrows we have um, to get a little bit more of that organic flow around the story. Um, because the second you start introducing sharp cornered arrows, it kind of gives a bit more of a architectural feel. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave it like that for now. There's probably a lot of little things that I do to fix it, but I'm going to go ahead and screenshot and then add a slide here. And I'm going to swing over if there's any other questions. Um, PNG files, JPEGs, okay. Thanks Francesca and Brigitte for kind of manning that um, live chat. Go back to my submissions here and I think we've got time for one or two more submissions. Um, if the lagginess of our internet permits and apologies again for the slight delay here um, in the rendering. I think it's the YouTube Live is probably giving it a bit of a slowness. Actually, I'm going to close up a couple tabs just to see if that helps. Okay. Oh, and to bring back that original version, let me just get a screen cap of that original again. So a couple things we covered is, you know, color matching your text to the objects that you're labeling. That automatically allows you to remove the sort of line that points to the object and, again, eliminating unnecessary elements, design elements to your picture. Um, you really want to reserve arrows and lines for actions when appropriate. Um, and then the ability for maybe those labels to exist on top of the object instead of actually pointing to it, again, eliminating more of those design elements and giving you back some space to your figure. Um, spacing things out as much as possible, really investing in padding and spacing as part of the figure. And you have to like really embrace the fact that your figures do need breathing room. 
um, in order to draw the eye towards the main event um, because sometimes you know too much is is actually going to harm the communication of your figure um, as opposed to the reverse and you probably see the reverse where there's too little information way less than the um, than the opposite so definitely trying to make sure that you maintain uh, some clarity in your picture by keeping space um, Decreasing opacity of elements. I'm actually going to just exit this. Oh, there we go. So decreasing um, opacity of the elements in your figure definitely helps with um, making sure that the main message really is very clear. Um, in fact, that's probably one thing, one last thing I would have done in this figure here with the four, the four quadrants is one last thing. Sorry, give me one second. That loads. Probably knock back. And you'd be surprised how far you can push it. So I'm at 60% opacity now for this top left figure. And you can still see it. It's obviously still very much a cell. Um, but I would definitely try to push the limits towards less opaque than not. And I know there's a fear of it, you know, not showing up in final print, but it is more than likely that it's going to show. So I definitely would not worry about that. There we go. So much clearer. Screenshot that. All right. Okay. So let's go through uh, maybe one more figure here. Let's see. Ah, this one was really cool. So this is another thing that we see quite a bit is, um, you know, we get asked, do can I add colors as background elements? to kind of separate out, you know, panels or concepts or, you know, group things within a colored background. And we definitely recommend doing it sparingly. So for this figure here, I would definitely remove um, some of the background blocks. Um, again, it is nice to have sometimes colored backgrounds but I think if you can get away with it, definitely avoid using colored backgrounds. Um, I think there's a couple of layers of backgrounds here. And this was actually submitted by Edel or Edel Lopez, um, a biology postdoc at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, the figure is called Strategy for the Characterization of Plasmodiaphora brassicae effectors. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, super interesting research and again we selected this because it brought up its own unique challenges and um, you can see here I'm just kind of removing the backgrounds um, I do appreciate what is trying to be communicated however and that is I think you know kind of um, the unhealthy versus healthy versus sort of mutated and maybe wild type versions um, Neatly off the bat, again, I think your your audience is going to be pretty uh, educated, so you might not need to show the sort of species or the macro view at the intensity level that you've shown it. So um, I do see that the color of the leaf is quite important. It looks like the darker leaf is part of the story here, so maybe I'll just leave that one to be very punchy. Um, but maybe these ones we can knock back just a little bit because I think the main part of the story is whatever's happening in these small purple boxes. Um, so I'm 
Just knock that back a little bit. And um, what we also recommend, if my computer can handle this right now, is grouping things so that it's easier to move objects around. So I'm going to kind of group this whole row and then move it around a little bit so that um, you can actually stack the things that you're trying to compare um, on top of each other. And if I'm looking carefully here, it looks like um, the bottom two plants are similar or they're the same plant um, under different conditions. But I would even knock back the macro view for these even smaller. So, um, you know, at the level that you're trying to show the plant versus the level that you're trying to show the DNA and the labels is a little bit mismatched. So I think we can push it um, even further. So maybe we decrease it to that size, like so. I'm actually going to ungroup that for now. Um, and that way, we're going to actually free up the space to um, increase the amount of information on the really important panel that's on the right side there. So I'm going to go ahead and ungroup that and make that much smaller. And when you're trying to do comparisons like this, again, this is very common, where you're probably going to want to show, um, you know, again, wild type versus mutation. And what you should try to do is almost stack them so that when you get a, a, you know, a fresh pair of eyes, which is going to be likely your audience when they first look at your figure, they're going to be able to, at a first glance, really quickly be able to make that connection. Um, maybe there was a reason that you put two at the top and two underneath, um, and I'm kind of missing that here, but um, sometimes when they're smaller and they're aligned, you actually get a better comparison, a better sense of what the differences are. So immediately I can see that the top one is kind of dead looking, the second one has got really dark leaves, and the last two don't. See how immediately you can see that relationship more clearly? Um, and of course, you know, readjust everything so that it fits. Um, but really nice job on the callouts, actually, because I know we do talk about that a lot as far as being able to save space by using these callouts. It looks like this one's pulled into the front layer, so I'm going to send it back. There we go. Um, and one thing that I'll do is to draw, there's actually quite a bit of attention being drawn to the callout triangle which is fine actually, because you do want people to be able to see what it is. Um, but if I, if this were my figure, I'd probably remove the border and um, maybe decrease the intensity of that. Because again, that's not the point of the story, I, I don't think at least, um, is kind of that zoom in. You can see a, a kind of a pattern that I'm that I'm doing here with all of the figures, and that's to really de-emphasize things that aren't important, um, and then re-emphasizing things that are, because you know first impressions are really important. And oh, it looks like we lost a couple of these here. I think they were floating around inside. Another reason why I sort of group things based on uh, sections. Uh, no border, knock it back. I think you all get the point here with the callouts, but see how already that's kind of creating a natural flow. And luckily now we have a lot of space that we've almost done some house cleaning here where we've got a lot of space to work with to call out this stuff. So this looks really important. Whatever's happening in here, I think is probably going to be almost the main event. So yeah, there's a lot of important information there that we were missing. So let's go ahead and you know zoom into that. This is obviously quite a challenging composition because um, 
Let's see here. I'm going to move this to the front. And I'm going to recreate this shape. I think we have all these funky um, sort of drawing tools here that you can use, which is great. It's new to our sort of shape category. Um, but yeah, I'd play around with this a little bit and maybe make um, a sort of call out that matches, you know, the dimensions that we're showing here. Oops. But for the sake of time, maybe I'll pause on this figure. Um, but you can already see it cleaning up quite a bit as far as being able to see the story right away. If if I'm getting the point of this story right, it looks like you're trying to do a comparison of the different uh, mutations or maybe states or environmental conditions for the species. Um, and when you do this sort of parallel comparison, it, it really draws the attention um, to that. So I'm just going to remove this block. Okay. Um, there we go. It's almost a breath of fresh air when you can finally read the contents of this figure. And we're not always going to have the luxury, your audience, audience isn't always going to have the luxury of seeing things um, at such a huge scale. And I'm wondering if the contents, if I didn't, if I, if I didn't move these around, I'm probably doing this wrong. So I apologize if I'm messing up the contents, but if the bottom two were actually the same, you could get away with even eliminating one of these. Oops one of these rows and then you could have you know the a or b options show up um, on top of each other to the right like that so you could feasibly just eliminate this middle row completely okay i'm gonna leave that there just so that my computer doesn't stall again um and again, this was sort of our first attempt at a YouTube Live, so I hope that you were able to follow along up to this point. Um, we are coming up to the 3 o'clock mark. Um, and as I mentioned, there were a lot more figures that I wanted to go through today, but we had to pick, you know, just a handful. Um, I will probably continue with one more figure if you want to stick around and watch. If you have to take off, no worries. Uh, I'm just going to look at our... Um, chat box here to see if we've got any other questions. Great, okay, so it looks like a few of you will be able to watch this later too, so that's great. Um, and apologies again for the internet slowness on my end. I think uh, it was ambitious to have YouTube Live running at the same time as these figures. So here's that simple figure again at the beginning. I'll just kind of show you the before and after, a challenge of showing, um, you know, shapes with a lot of text like this that's kind of in a weird, skinny, long format. Um, here was our solution. So going down to this before and after, so you don't have to watch me fiddle with the lines and text. Um, we kind of created a little bit more of a, I guess, horizontal schema and I'm going to remove all of the guidelines. But you can see guidelines are very important. Even for professionals, we do uh, make sure that we use this. We don't trust our own eye. Similar to how really good chefs use timers. Good chefs have like 20 timers going. Um, I'm going to delete all guidelines. Clear all guidelines. Okay, so really clean look and feel. Um, it does look like it's bigger, but actually if I zoom out, the text is going to be probably about the same size and I think better use of space. Um, and instead of sort of those boxy lines going around, we use this curved square line that kind of gives it a really nice flow. Um, and similar to the last figure we did, we actually stacked the last two uh, resulting mutations um, 
or differentiated shapes um, on top of each other so you at least know where to draw the eye. Um, we also added these little bullet points in front of the words so it didn't look like um, kind of you know a gibberish paragraph. It actually looked like a list of things in almost no, no particular order. It's just kind of trying to fit within that box. Um, so lots of little things that will really help draw the eye in the direction that you want. So I hope that's clear. I'm going to get a bit of a screenshot of that as well. I also like doing this when I'm doing my before and afters so you can really see if it's a dramatic um, a dramatic change from the before to the after figure. So going back um, can just preview it here. This was the before and again it's kind of natural that uh, we tend to sort of stack words the way that they were shown here. Okay. Cool. So we can do really quick look through of this. Um, I hope you can see it because, yeah, it's a little bit laggy on my end, but there's the before, there's the after, much cleaner. And again, I'd go in and fix up those letters, before and after. So it's, it's subtle, but it definitely makes a difference. See how the arrows were also a little bit more um, cohesive? It's subtle, but it makes the main message much more clear. Um, this was the after. I didn't get the before because my computer was on the fritz a little bit. Um, and this is the before. This is the after. See that kind of, um, even for this one. So I, I thought it was a really nice, clear composition. You didn't get too caught up in, you know, designs and decorations, which is excellent. Um, so all I wanted to know was, where does my eye begin and where does it end? I didn't know if I should start where the prolifer prol proliferation label was. It actually, I think, starts at the top left corner, which is actually pretty good. Naturally, you would want to go from left to right, up to down. But I think in this composition, it's very clear that you read from left to right, and the NG2 cell is where you start, and then you can kind of branch off to two different potential uh, you know, lineages or results, which I think here works quite well the before and the after, and much more kind of better use of space, I'd say. But besides that, I think it was already well on its way to do it, to be, be a nice figure. Great, so I think that's all the time we have for this uh, sort of makeover session. Um, let me refer back to the YouTube channel to see if we have any other questions. And yes, this will be um, available as a recording to watch afterwards. So it looks like there was a question there about that. Um, still got quite a few people on the line watching. If you are interested, I can continue to do one more figure, but I think based on the lagginess of my internet right now, it might not be a possibility within the time frame. I'm going to go ahead and open the last image that I really wanted to cover because I thought it was beautifully done. And it is about um, sort of blood-brain barrier disruption. And let's see if it'll pull up. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes right now by um, Elias or Elias Rawish, um, University of Lübeck in Germany. The title is uh, Platelet-Mediated Inflammation and Multiple Sclerosis and corresponding mice model of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Encephalomyelitis. Um, I just wanted to see, show how beautiful this figure was. It's probably about, you know, 80-90% there as far as being ready for a publication or, you know, presentation. Um, a few things I probably would have uh, adjusted just a little bit is, um, I think, the spacing around letters within this little pill shape. So when we talk about padding as a whole, we also talk about padding within the protein shapes. 
So just give them a little bit more breathing room. It's really subtle, but you can see here that giving it a little bit of breathing room does help. So I'm gonna just stretch it out. And it's, again, it's really subtle. If there's a reason why it had to be small like that, then you know maybe we can't get away with giving it some padding, but right away, see how that kind of frees up. It gives it a little bit of um, you know, room to breathe. And it really does make a difference. Um, so that's really nice once you've got that. Um, I also wanted to point out um, the verbs of your figure should be slightly different from the labels. So this PSGL1 label um, or P-selectin together, these two proteins interacting, that's fine as is. But the blood-brain barrier disruption sounds like it's kind of the overarching theme. Um, so I'd probably maybe even italicize it, make it a bit bigger. And um, I guess you could even color pick the nuclei or something. So it's a little bit different from the rest. It's kind of like um, something that's happened already. Um, and then everything else is a result of that. Or maybe that becomes the title of your figure. Sometimes it's, it is nice to have um, a larger title to the figure. So if I were to kind of go back on my suggestion here and remove that italics and um, you know, make it a dark font and then make it really large, it could almost become the title of the figure. But the point is to create that hierarchy because um, it's hard for your eye to see where to start and where to begin. Um, CNS parenchyma, um, it sounds like you wanted to show that everything, and I think that's the reason why you created this um, sort of yellow square as a background, is because you wanted to show that, you know, this is not empty space, it's actually kind of the parenchyma within this um, central nervous system. So um, I'd probably change this to be a slightly different color so that people don't think it's a protein floating off into the distance. It's actually just the background. So um, that one I would definitely change to something like a warmer tone to match the background color. It's a little bit of a softer. Maybe gray or something like that. Um, and the rest looks really good. Um, let's see, it looks like the myelin sheath destruction and neurodegeneration is the most important part of the story. Um, this happens a lot. I have an example here. Again, I'm picking on this picture because it's so beautiful that it can stand some critique. Um, but we've all been there where we've you know been in a classroom or writing on a blackboard and you start really big and then as you get to the very end, you start to run out of space and then your text and labels and spacing get really, really, really small. This is super normal. This happens to everybody. That happens to the best of us when we're designing for a figure. We have to kind of readjust everything to make it fit retroactively. So um, I think we're getting a little bit of that in this figure where a lot of stuff was happening. And then at the very end, we've thrown in the neuron. So um, I think unless you really wanted to maybe zoom in and focus in on that top part, which is actually quite fine if that was the main part of the story and this is a bit of an afterthought, uh, then that's okay. But I think maybe what we can do is free up some of um, the space above, oh sorry, below, um, by taking it from the top. And we can usually tell this when we look at the space between the top here and compared to the bottom, it's definitely smaller. That means that there was a little bit of retroactive spacing that needed to happen after the fact. So um, what you can do is obviously you rearrange your whole image by bumping it up a little bit, which is what I'm doing here. And again, this is, you know, even the, the best professionals in the world have to always go back and make more room for the 
for the very bottom part of the story. So that's probably what I do for this figure once, you know, you kind of realigned everything else. And I'm gonna um, deselect this neuron and just kind of skew the arrows up a little bit so that I can kind of make more room for this neuron. And again, this bottom text looks really important, so I'm going to make that nice and big. So I think that was the point of the story, to show that all this stuff happens, and then we get sort of deconstruction, destruction and neurodegeneration. So lots of little things. One more thing I'd probably add, just because this, you know, is basically looking like a professional created it, um, is the sort of natural flow and curvature of arrows. Um, this is something that we talk about a lot internally, and so um, you kind of want to envision, and it's hard to explain here, but maybe I'll draw with a pencil tool. You kind of want to envision the arrow going through the cell, so it would follow along here, and where would the natural curve end up? That's where you should be drawing the lines. So I just kind of drew with my pencil here. So this arrow would probably start a little bit further down. And again, this is really minor, but it actually does make a difference when your eye is trying to follow along the curvature of that story. Just slightly less sharp of an edge um, makes a world of a difference. Okay. So I think I'll pause there um, because we are way over time. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat box. We still got quite a few people on the line, so appreciate you sticking around for this long. Um, after this, I think this video will just remain on our YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed this, if you want more examples like this, let me know um, again in the chat, and then we'll make sure to do more of these in the future. Um, for the figures that we weren't able to get to, we're really excited to be able to kind of highlight those, hopefully on better internet connection for the next ones, and uh, go through even more of the tutorials and the techniques that we went through um, during our, our SciComm week. So after this, we're actually going to be going to be announcing a couple of cool features with EnviroEnder. So um, make sure you look on our Twitter channel for that. We're going to be announcing a couple of really cool features we've just launched in Byrender. Um, and then tomorrow, stick around because on Twitter, we're going to be doing a little bit of a shift from sort of the general techniques and tips on how to draw as far as color and text and shape towards more of a public leaning science communication um, sort of strategy. You know, how do you speak to broad audiences? Um, how do you communicate to non-technical audiences and non-scientists? Um, and imagery is very specific for those types of audiences as well. So if you're interested in that, definitely look at our YouTube, oh sorry, uh, Twitter feed, and we'll be posting um, just like we have for the past few days on um, tips and tricks on how to do that better. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining. I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you for joining. Thanks uh, to all those that are participating in the chat. And we look forward to running future events like this. Um, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, because that will notify you every time we upload new videos, new tutorials, and host more uh, live figure makeovers. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.